Good afternoon. Welcome to our worship service here at St. John's this afternoon. We've been following the series in our midweek services entitled Promised Treasures, so different items, different things from the Bible that remind us of the blessings and the treasures that we have in Jesus, our Savior. And today is the last one, and that is palms or palm branches, and that is a reminder of the victory that we have in Christ. And uh, that'll be our focus today. And since I see I'm not the focus right now, I'm going to step aside. Uh, <laughs> we have our K4, K5 children to, to lead off the worship. Uh, if you're watching online, you should be able to find a bulletin in the menu tab. Thank you. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, search our hearts and minds that we may receive your word, share in your spirit, and be renewed in our relationships with you and with one another. With humble hearts, let us pray together. Lord Jesus, the Father's only Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, hear us as we pray. You call us to celebrate your victory over death in the grave, but often we resign ourselves to defeat and refuse to give you our praise. Our rebellion against you in thought, word, and action is why you died for us. To forgive our sins, to redeem our lives, and to cancel the debt we owe to God. With hearts that are humble and lives ever grateful, help us to receive your grace, bow before you in worship, and confess that you alone are Lord. To the glory of God the Father, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, shows his mercy to us in the sending of his only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the eternal King of Israel, King David's royal Son, who in the Lord's name comes to bless us with life and salvation. 
As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, palms lifted high were waved in the air to celebrate your triumph. As those who know you as King and Savior, help us to be all, all together joyful because of your victory over our foes. Renew our hearts and minds during this Lenten season as we receive the promised treasures of your word. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this afternoon is from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16. So all the readings in one way or another will have something to do with, with palms. In this section, you'll, you'll hear about the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a special feast for the Old Testament Israelites. It was one of three uh, pilgrimage feasts where the Israelite males were required to go to Jerusalem for these, this festival. And during this festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, they would actually live in tents. They would set up tents in Jerusalem that were uh, decorated often with palm branches for shade. Um, and this was a reminder of how God had provided for his people as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And how even though the people were unfaithful, God was faithful and brought them into the promised land. Celebrate the festival of tabernacles for seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press. Be joyful at your festival. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns. For seven days, celebrate the festival to the Lord your God at the place the Lord will choose. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all your, the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. Three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. This is the word of the Lord. We join in our psalm.
Our second reading is from Revelation chapter 7, and this will be the basis of the message today. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel for this afternoon is from John chapter 7, and we see in this section that Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem during that Feast of Tabernacles that I mentioned earlier, and he proclaims himself as the ultimate source of provision for God's people. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time. And then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Lord. Please be seated. We continue with our next hymn. Jesus, hello God. 
How are you doing? Parents with small kids, you're still hanging in there? Okay. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, the message is based on that second lesson. You can find that on page six in your worship folder. I'll just read the first couple of verses, um, but you may want to keep it open to this section. Remember that this is a vision that Jesus gave to his disciple, his apostle John. And John is, is speaking, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. This is God's word. We bow our heads to pray. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, our Savior, this coming Monday night, there's going to be a big victory celebration. Some of you know what I'm talking about. The NCAA men's basketball champion. Um, none of the teams I picked to win the tournament are even in the tournament anymore, um, but that's beside the point. But by the, the end of Monday night, one team is going to be victorious, and then there's going to be just mass chaos. And maybe you've seen that before when, when the fans, they just flood onto the floor, and you got confetti falling down from the ceiling. You have um, players and coaches they're hugging each other. They're even hugging people that they don't know, uh, other people on the floor with them. It's just this huge victory celebration. And one thing that's done during that celebration is a trophy is presented to the winning team, and, and they don't just, like, put it on the, on the bench on the side. They lift that trophy high up for everyone to see. 
Another part of that victory celebration is uh, they all get to participate. There's, there's the players, there's the coaches, sometimes I think even the managers, they, they uh, climb up on the ladder and they, they cut a little piece of that net um, so that they can each hold in their hand a symbol of victory, what they've accomplished together. So they, they get this trophy, symbol of victory, they, they get... Um, that piece of a net in their hand. And it's a pretty cool thing. And unless it was like when Wisconsin lost a few years back, then you're kind of, you don't want to watch anybody celebrate. But it's kind of a neat thing to see. But that celebration, as great as it is, doesn't hold a candle to this much larger celebration that we hear about here in Revelation chapter 7 people from every nation and tribe and people and language on earth. You couldn't even count them all. And they are all there together, and they are are before the Lord Almighty. They're in heaven. They're allowed to be in the presence of God. And they're worshiping the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who was, it says earlier, slain, but now he is alive again. And it's, it's this group, this large gathering. That's what we want to focus our attention on for a few moments this afternoon. And notice what they all have in common, what they're all holding, that symbol of victory, not a trophy, not not a piece of a net, but they're holding palm branches. And so we want to ask ourselves today, how did these people get there? And how are they able able to celebrate this victory? And how is it that that palms can serve as, as a promised treasure for us. Sometimes, maybe, if you're like me, if you see a celebration like that, like a NCAA championship celebration or a Super Bowl, whatever, uh, it kind of makes you think, boy, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool to be in that group, to have accomplished that and to, to take part in that? You know, I'd like to do that, and then, but then, you know, like the reality part of you kind of kicks in, and you say, well, I'm not really going to be able to do that. I mean, me, I'm, I'm too old, way too old. Uh, but even if you're not too old, of the millions of young people who aspire to get into that position, um, hardly any of them do. In fact, um, all of the other teams that were in the tournament... Uh, all but that one championship team, all of them will not taste this, this taste of, of thrill of victory, but rather have the, the agony of defeat. But the bigger question is, what about that other group? What about that bigger, better celebration that we see here in, in Revelation chapter 7? How about we ask ourselves the same question regarding them? Um, could I be part of that group? Should I be part of of that group? Well, I have three passages that I'd like to share with you that I could have picked a lot more, but that'll help us answer that that question. Should you and should I um, be be there together with the Lord, or should we be apart from him? Based on Jesus' statement here, this is number one, Everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Am I in the group or out of that group? A little bit later in the book of Revelation, it says, Nothing impure will ever enter heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. Does that mean I'm in or I'm out? The last one, anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. In this group or, or not. And then we start to think, you know, substance abuse, and cursing, lust, gossip, neglecting the needs of my neighbor. Same question, do, do I belong in this group? Same answer. And then we have the devil and our conscience. They add their voices, uh, voices of confirmation to that answer. And there's that, that little part of us that knows um, about our own guilt, and, and it's nodding its head and saying, yeah, it would have to be 
um, not be a part of this and rather be a part of this, a part of this, which means apart from God, apart from, from heaven, apart from this whole celebration, and, and you know what that is, that's, that's hell. Were it not, which are three words that mean something good is coming, were it not for the Lamb before whom they were standing, the Lamb who is right at the center of this vision, standing near the center of the throne, and you know who he is, right? It's a representation of, of Jesus Christ. You remember how John the Baptist pointed people to Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this Lamb of God, he is the center of attention in this vision, standing right there in the middle. That Lamb of God who once stood before Pontius Pilate and his judgment seat and was pronounced guilty, even though he knew he wasn't guilty. That Lamb of God who stood before a Roman cross when they told him he had to carry it down the way of sorrows and outside of the city, through the city gates and past the city walls out to where he would be crucified and it buckled his knees. That Lamb of God who once stood beneath the full fury of God's wrath that was directed directly at your sin and my sin as he turned Jesus into all the sinners of the world bundled into one body and he crushed him and condemned him. That Lamb of God who at, at a certain point could not stand any longer as the curse of God caused his heart to stop beating and his body was laid out in a grave. But he's not there anymore. He's here. Right here in this reading, looking as if he is a lamb who was slain. Yeah, but now he is alive forever. And now pan out to that, the rest of that, that group again, those, that group that's holding those branches, the, the symbol of, of victory. Look at them and, and ask yourself, is there something familiar about these people? Because there should be. Because they're just like you. And they would have had to answer those questions I asked previously, should I be in or should I be out of this group, in the same way that, that you and I would have to answer, no, don't stand a chance. And yet, there they are. Because there's something else that they all have in common. They're not all just holding those branches, the symbol of victory, but they're all wearing robes, bleached in blood. These are the ones that have washed their robes and made them white, which is a symbol of holiness in the blood of the Lamb. It's the clothing that, that Jesus provides, the clothing that Jesus invites us to wear, his holiness, his perfection, the forgiveness of sins. The only reason that these people are there is they've been washed they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason, because this is true, then, then there's this perfectly complete list of ten items that describe these people in heaven, these people who have Jesus' holiness, people who have had their sins washed away. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Perfect list of ten, the number of perfection in Revelation. They are as blissful as blissful can be. And when you look closely at these people, you can see yourself in this vision. Who are these? Well, sir, you know. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. 
If you were to fast forward this vision, what John is, is seeing here is what happens every time a Christian dies. So if you would roll this, this scene forward, you would see yourself in this vision, leaving the place of constant problems and entering the place of no problems. They are before the throne of God, and they're dressed in white robes. They have the perfection of Jesus. They have passed through a death that has no sting. And they look at themselves, and they see, hey, I'm wearing these white robes. I have this branch palm branch, a symbol of victory in my hand, and part of this big celebration. And that's you when that day comes. And it's really even you before that day comes. The robes you'll be wearing then in heaven are the robes that, that you're already wearing right now, the robes that Jesus gives to you. They're given to you at your baptism. Paul says, all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. So those passages I mentioned earlier, those reasons why it's pretty clear that we really shouldn't be in this group, but rather apart from, from this group, careless words and impurity and shame and dece deceit, not doing uh, the good that we ought to do, it's all covered in Christ. He gave that to you in your baptism. He gives that to you in his announcements in the Bible when he tells you about a justification that is from God that has been given to you so that nothing can separate you from this, this ultimate celebration which is before God and, and with God's people as long as you're wearing those clothes. So keep them on. Don't hide your sin. Don't make excuses for it, but confess it. Don't think that, that you yourself are worthy to be in this group and, and in the presence of God. Instead, count on Christ and his righteousness and his sacrifice in your place. Monday night, one team is going to celebrate their championship, and they're going to hold up their trophy. They're going to hold part of a net in their hands, and those are symbols of their victory, what they worked so hard to accomplish, uh, what they did together, and what all those other teams didn't get, and, and they got. What we remember, based on this section of Scripture, is, is to be a part of this celebration to hold on to that palm branch, which means eternal victory. It has nothing to do with, with who I am and what I've done or what I have sacrificed or, or what we've even achieved maybe together. But rather, as it says in our text, salvation belongs to our God, who through the lamb that was slain and has been raised again gives us the victory. On Sunday, we start the most blessed week of the year, Holy Week, and we get to see the Lamb of God enter Jerusalem on our behalf so that he might go to the cross for us and come out of the tomb victorious to guarantee us that, that that's our victory too. So with the hosts of heaven, we can say praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We continue with a prayer. Gracious God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to meditate again on the cross of Christ and receive your promised treasures. Lead us to see that our sins caused Jesus great agony in the garden, that our sins nailed him to the cross of Calvary. Lord.
Lord Jesus, grant that especially during this sacred season, the treasured story of your wondrous love for us would draw us closer to you. Holy Spirit, lift up troubled souls everywhere. Grant wholeness to those hurting in heart, body, and mind. Work your healing power in the lives of those in need, especially Lyle Tim's brother, who is in the hospital in ICU with serious health concerns. We also pray for Philip de Blasi's family as at the loss of his father, Sal yesterday. We ask you to be with them and to comfort them with the promise of the resurrection and eternal life that Jesus gives. We ask you to be with them and in the lives of all we name before you in our hearts. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. We close with our final hymn. Good afternoon. Once again, thank you for joining us for worship here. Uh, 
Thank you to our children for leading us off today. Maybe we, let's give them another round of applause. I have a, a few announcements here. That's three to five, right? Um, regarding Holy Week, which starts this coming Sunday, um, there are postcards available for you with our, our Holy Week schedule on it. They're, they're out in the Welcome Center on the kiosk, and we would invite you to take a few of these with you on your way out today and, and invite somebody to come and join us for our worship services during Holy Week. Also, we're doing a couple of special things. Uh, one is on Good Friday. If you choose, uh, you may write down a sin or a hurt, worry, or struggle and seal it in an envelope, and you'll be given an opportunity to lay it at the foot of the cross during our Good Friday service. We're going to have a big cross right here up in front, and they're going to be tossed afterwards. No one's going to be reading these things, but it's just a way of... of uh, showing our appreciation and, and our recognition that all of our sins were paid for by Jesus on the cross. So that's an opportunity for Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday, we have a special Easter dawn service, which is at 6.30, and that will have a special focus. It'll be different from the other two services at the normal times on Sunday. It'll focus on our new life in baptism. So that, that's a kind of a separate one. We will also have Easter breakfast between... The, hymn, or the, uh, the services on Sunday. Um, you're invited to uh, provide a suite to share for that breakfast as well. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. Um, except that you're invited to a potluck dinner right after this service. Um, people uh, have brought food. If you did not bring food, that doesn't mean you can't come. So uh, even if you didn't bring anything, please feel free to, to stay and, and have a bite to eat and enjoy fellowship with one another. With that in mind, why don't we join in the common table prayers before we, we go over there? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Amen. One final thing, if you could just drop your bulletins off on the back pew for the next service, that would be great. And if you haven't filled out a Connect card, please take a moment to do that. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.